Good evening, everyone. We are continuing with our The Essence of the Bhagavad Gita, Swami Kriyananda's commentary based on Yogananda's teaching. We're only up to chapter four, so we're not really speeding through it, but we're moving through it with great interest. I hope you feel that way. So let's start with a prayer, and then we'll go into our um, stanzas for today. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Uteshwar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dearest Friend Swami Kriyananda, Humbly we bow to you all. Bless us that the great wisdom and power of this scripture may permeate us, body, mind, and spirit, that our consciousness will shift and we will feel ourselves to be there with Krishna, understanding by deep intuition the power and grace of these eternal teachings. Om Peace. Amen. All right, my friends, we are in chapter four of the Gita, which is, um, let's just see where we are. In Swamiji's books, book, the chapters, we are up to chapter 16 of the book, but only four of the Gita. And this is called The Supreme Science of Knowing. So we are up to chapter four, verse 31 and 32. By eating the blessed food, prasad, left from any of these spiritual fire rituals, any of the ones that we have been talking about in the previous stanzas, one attains Brahman, the infinite spirit. Even the blessings of this world come not to him. Even the blessings of this world come not to him who gives gives nothing of himself. How then can he hope for happiness in a better world? 432, that's enough right there. We can just stay there for the rest of the evening. Maybe we should just should do that, should, should do that for a moment. Let me just give the second verse here. 432, the many ways of offering up the ego are declared in the Vedas, Vedas as if through the mouth of Brahma, Knowing their true purpose, which is an upward self-offering, you will be freed from all karmic bondage. Now what Swami goes on to describe here is he's talking about the mouth of Brahma, Swamiji explains, is the first chakra, and the upward moving energy is the energy which is moving through the spine to the spiritual eye. Now, Swami explains here that Everything that we consider to be spiritual progress is the result of the shifting of the flow of energy within us. That everything else that we do that we consider to be religion or spirituality or service to the world, the real purpose of all of it is that in some way it actually changes the flow of energy in the spine. And it... um, the, 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 the universal unifying factor in all spiritual traditions is this upward flow of energy in the spine. In, a, in another book that Swami has written, which I often refer to, which is called The Hindu Way of Awakening, Swamiji makes this point that the, the unity of religions will never be attained when we look at what he calls the way of belief. And I, I, I talk about this in various programs. I don't know if, I've, if I'm repeating myself here or not. We'll just have to go through it if we have. I'm going to rely upon you to call upon something that we always used with Swamiji. I heard Swamiji teach the same subjects over and over again because there was always another aspect to it. So even when I find myself sort of explaining something that I've explained before, 
which given how much I talk is inevitable and happens often, if the same um, basic explanation applies in a new situation, um, there's always something more subtle in it. it in, in fact, it's a, it's a cliché at this point, but I'm old enough to operate in clichés and feel unashamed of it, which is that the older I'm on, the longer I'm on the spiritual path, the more the simplest ideas communicate to me. Um, that, that the complexity is not as fascinating anymore as the depth of that which is simple. So back to the Hindu way of awakening, Swami talks about um, every spiritual tradition, what we call religion, has its way of belief. And these are all the practices that people do. Um, the, the Catholics have a mass, um, the Jews have their particular ceremonies, the Protestants, the Lutherans do it this way, the Mormons have that one, the Hindus have this, the Buddhists have that. The Zoroastrians will do this, the Sufis will do something else. And all of us do different things. So the ecumenical movement, which is ex extremely beneficial, is that people come together, they try to understand what each other are doing, they try to be um, expansive in their appreciation and respect for what others are doing. But nonetheless, they will contradict each other. You know, just start with the Christians and the Jews. The Christians have this deep devotion to Jesus as the Messiah, and the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come. So if you just look at it on that way, they just, they contradict each other. And we can be extremely respectful that this is how you feel, but nonetheless, there's no possibility of unity. We just can't, we can't come out the same on the level of belief. But then Swami talks about every religious tradition, their way of belief is designed for one purpose, and that's where the unity comes, which is that we actually change our consciousness. And we actually become what all the saints and avatars describe as our inevitable destiny. Kind, ethical, concerned for others, generous of spirit, courageous in the face of obstacles, cheerful in the face of opposition, um, uh, generous when criticized, you know, expansive in our support of others. We can make a long list of virtues. Um, do unto others as we wish them to do unto us. I mean, all these different words, but what they all describe is a fundamental shift in our consciousness, a shift in our perception of the world. And what that shift represents is that we are awakening to a higher dimension. We are awakening to a greater reality. So what all spiritual traditions have in common is the way of awakening. And the reason we have them all in common is not merely that all religious traditions seek to awaken their devotees, but the, but the process of awakening is exactly the same. The way of belief can be very different, but the process of awakening, because it has to do with the way that we're made. You know, a Hindu person, a Catholic person, a Lutheran, a Zoroastrian, when the body is placed in front of a surgeon and the surgeon cuts it open, they're going to find the same organs in essentially the same places, all performing exactly the same functions. You know, the knee joint on a Hindu person is not different than the knee joint on a Protestant because it's the way we're made. So um, when we talk about spirituality, we're not talking about any sectarian, denominational, racial, cultural, anything. It's exactly the same as, as Master says it, when you peel back the skin, we're all the same inside. So when we start talking about the means by which actual transformation takes place, it, we're all made the same way. And Swamiji, and, and it, it has to do with the interiorization, the intensification, and the elevation of the inner energy. And so spiritual souls of all traditions recognize each other. 
because they have all transferred their focus from um, being defined by the outer world to being defined by the inner world. In other words, we've interiorized our focus. Um, I, I remember uh, I was talking to a friend and we, we ended up talking about you know, the 60s and the 70s a little bit and about psychedelic drugs because um, we were both interested in reports that have come out recently where certain psychedelic drugs have proved to be very efficacious in helping people overcome PTSD, which is an extremely pernicious mental condition that holds people um, bound. But apparently certain clinical use of of psychedelic substances have helped people who suffer from PTSD to expand beyond that that trauma, that terrible prison, seemingly because they have an experience of a greater reality. Well, I was just sort of thinking that through, and it it crossed my mind that even though I went through that era rather lightly, because I am a, a, I'm very attached to my clear mind, and so I'm not a person who's seeking to escape from the clarity of my mind. In fact, I my my psychedelic career was rather short-lived because I quickly realized <laughs> that whenever I ingested anything, which was not often, I really spent the entire time waiting for it to wear off. <laughs> which, when I really thought about that, that was really the whole thing just didn't make any sense. <laughs> but it also occurred. But I, but I was strongly influenced. I was strongly influenced by my first experience because it taught me about the way of awakening. Because it taught me, and I'd never, I'd never even had a sip of alcohol at that point. Although probably at Passover, I might have sipped a little bit of wine, but I'd, I'd never, I had never done anything that affected my consciousness chemically. So I did something that affected my consciousness chemically, and and what I saw was that if you change your consciousness, you change everything. But I actually realized, and it never actually occurred to me, I never had a particularly positive experience of any kind. I never had, you know, the big transcendental, we're all one experiences that many of my peers really did have that put them on the spiritual path. Swami Kriyananda was very much against all of these recreational drugs, so to speak. But he had to admit that, that some psychedelics did catalyze people towards spiritual life, and I was certainly one of them. Not because I had any experiences, but because the principle was demonstrated to me. Change your consciousness, you change everything. And thank you, God, for never attracting me any deeper into it. But because that is the way of awakening, is we change our consciousness. And all spiritual traditions, I mean, not all spiritual traditions, all languages, because it's based on human experience, When things are positive, we talk about an upward flow. And when things are negative, we talk about a downward flow. Swami spoke six or eight languages, and he said all languages were the same. There was no, there's no language that that says the equivalent in whatever language it is. I feel so wonderful today, absolutely down in the dumps. (laughs) You just don't say it. (laughs) Because no human being responds that way. Even whatever your cultural tradition is, when we're happy, we go up. And when we're sad, we go down. Because that is the grossest physical manifestation of the fact that we have a, a center, flow of energy, uh, which is the, the spine and deeper than the what we call the spine. But we're not talking about the physical spine. We're talking about the astral spine, the energy self. Nowadays, with all these movies, that are just so wonderfully illustrative. And there's countless ones in which the theme is somebody dies, but they don't really leave this world. And they they hang out and they try to communicate. So you have the actor falls over dead. And then by the technique of film, the actor stands up again, except the body they're walking around in no longer can connect to the material world. So they talk and they... um, they try to interact and they try to get attentions, but you know, they walk through walls and 
people can't hear or see them. It's, it's actually, it's been great. It's made my job a whole lot easier. <laughs> when I started in the 70s, these movies were not so common because consciousness was not so interested. Nowadays, it's like all of these things are just ordinary language. I remembered in the 80s when I was beginning to travel and um, speak and trying to find programs that people would come to, one of the most popular programs I could give was about the chakras. I was talking to Swamiji because he was launching me. He was helping me to understand how to do this kind of work. And I mentioned to him that the chakras were the most, one of the most popular subjects. He just smiled so sweet. He said, really? He said, you know, when he was out teaching in the, in the 50s and a little bit into the 60s, he said nobody had any idea what the chakras were. And in 20 years, it's just become... Well, you can buy soap, you can buy laundry detergent, you know, you can just buy everything. For a long time, Gyandev, who is the director of the yoga teacher training program that emanates from Ananda Village, from the Expanding Light, now is where it emanates, and now it's all an online program. We would have, and we still have our annual spiritual renewal week, which was kind of a gathering of the tribes. And every year, for many years, he would give the award, he had a clever name for it, which I don't remember, but the basic was the most egregious misuse of yoga to sell a completely inappropriate product. <laughs> because it began to be common knowledge. I mean, and now you see it everywhere. You know, the, you can assume a, 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 a yoga position and so on, and um, everybody knows what you're talking about. When I saw the animated film Soul, S-O-U-L, which was a, a, I loved it. It was absolutely delightful. I loved everything about it, including the fact that it existed, that it was even like made, and it was made by a company that knows how to make money. And that the whole idea that we're, that there's an astral world and that we enter all, that, that after we die, we get on this little conveyor belt and we go toward the astral world. It was marvelously whimsical um, so that it, it was not uh, theistic, it, it didn't represent any theology, so nobody was offended. Somebody told me that they actually had multiple consultants to make sure they were not accurate to anybody's theology, but not ant antithetical to anybody's theology, so that everyone could enjoy it. So these little sort of blue bowling balls, which represented our souls, went up on astral, on uh, conveyor belts to the astral world, and then there was all these scenes about people getting ready to reincarnate. And they were all just true enough and goofy enough that you could just kind of like enjoy it without having to take it too seriously. And then there was some uh, character who was like a, 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 a character from my, my upbringing, like a 60s hippie sort of guy who would kind of like was frozen in time somewhere. But one of the most fun things I loved about it was somewhere in, in that particular scene, they, they made all these esoteric references to the chakras, to meditation, to the energy in the spine. And that just tells me that it is absolutely mainstream culture, which is we are moving into a brand new age. You know, when you can make, make humor out of something, that means people understand it well enough to actually be able to know what the joke is which is way, way, way advanced into this, which is absolutely terrific, just absolutely terrific. So what we're talking about, now I'm going to talk about it seriously, although pop culture helps. You know, what we're talking about is that our physical reality emanates from this core of dynamic non-physical energy. And when we're interiorizing our energy, from the material world, we're not actually retreating from reality. What we're actually doing is going much, much deeper into reality. Speaking back of those many years ago, like in the early 80s, when I first started traveling, this was even in the late 70s, traveling uh, up and down the West Coast with friends, and we would um, have little, we do little programs in people's homes or in metaphysical bookstores, of which there were quite a few at that time. And and I, one of the early trips that I took, um, I had a, a slideshow, which is how we, that was advanced multimedia at that point. We had a slideshow 
of pictures of Ananda community. And one of the things I would do, and Ananda community was Ananda village, there was only one. And we had these beautiful idyllic pictures of, you know, the forest and the little huts that we lived in, in our temple and our meditation and the goats and the little school. It was, it was all true to life and it was all fabulous. And I would present this as an example of what we were doing so that people could become um, intrigued enough to become interested. And it was also a way of, of putting forward that this was more than just imagination, that there was a, a group of people, a hundred and something at that point, who were really manifesting a completely new vision, a new vision for life. So I'm a good saleswoman because I have convinced myself. And so I would talk to people and they would get very enamored. And every time, I think without exception, when I would show those pictures, someone would say, well, that all sounds really beautiful for all of you. But what about those of us who live in the real world? It would always be with that tone. And there would be that word, the real world, which means the world that they lived in instead of the one that I lived in. And for maybe five of the six weeks or, or four of the six weeks, every time that question came, I would, I would take it very seriously and I would talk about how practical this was and so on. And I either got fatigued or else I finally got my brain together on it. And I finally realized they were not talking about the real world. They were talking about the most superficial, ephemeral, transitory world that there is, which is to stake yourself out on this material world. That's what they were saying. And I began to realize that my experience of moving from, and I, my direct move, I was actually living in the city of San Francisco briefly, but that was the spot from which I moved to Ananda Village. I moved from an apartment in the back of the building at 3rd and Geary, in San Francisco, directly to Ananda Village. I'd never even camped out. And I, I put up a tent. <laughs> I moved into the tent. I lived in the tent for six months um, until the, the tent was heavy with the snow. We had an early snow that year. Um, it, took me, I, it took me 24 hours to adjust to being not in the city, but to being in this tent. 24 hours, and I never looked back. Because far from being the apartment in San Francisco being real. The life in this community, close to nature, simple living, that was real life. And much more than that, this was what the more important part. Living in an urban environment, and I know many people do, and I myself have lived in an urban environment now for 30 years, so this is me also. But what this environment does is it constantly tries to draw me into the illusion. It constantly tries to persuade me that the ephemeral is more important than the eternal. And it provides endless distractions from the necessity to really be with myself and be with the reality of who I am. Now, it was much more dramatic in the first 10 years living at Ananda Village where we had no electricity, we had no telephones, internet, of course, hadn't even been invented, and we were really living in isolation, without distractions. And believe me, I was dealing a lot more with the real world on every level because of the commitment I had made to, to discover, to accept, and to relate to that which was lastingly true. I mean, what, what is the word for real? Real is the truth. And the truth of our own nature is that everything emanates from that inward energy. And everything about our lives is determined by the quality of that inward energy. Our lives are not the result of the money we have, the job we have, the way people relate to us, the status. That's not where our lives are determined. Our lives are determined from the vibration of our own energy. Change your consciousness and you change everything. I'm, I'm sure many of you have had the same experiences that I've had of, of trying to help people who have an inclination to be depressed 
or an inclination, an addiction to some kind of a drug or some kind of unhealthy way of relating. You know, whatever the consciousness a person is living with, that's what they live with. You can be sitting right next to someone who's depressed and you see, you see no reason in all of creation for that depression, but that doesn't have any effect on the person who's having it. Or this passionate need to be inebriated or to be stoned or to be whatever it is that a person must have. They're compelled from their inner energy. And then the outer rela reality they live in is entirely determined from that point of view. So from the spiritual, which is what Swami is talking about here, what we're really trying to do, all of our spiritual practices, they have one purpose, to draw our awareness inward, to, re to in, uh, in intensify that experience, and then to elevate it. And to elevate it literally means the energy moves up the spine from the mouth of Brahma, which is the first, the earth chakra, moves up the spine eventually through the Shashumna, which is the deep inward channel where that subtle energy flows and, and flows you know, upward to the spiritual life from which we can direct our lives appropriately. The medulla and the spiritual eye are two sides of the same chakra. The medulla is individuality identified with limitation. The spiritual eye is individuality identified with infinity. You can see it makes all the difference in the world. And so this is what... Um, <clears throat> so knowing that all of the, uh, the rites and rituals, which is what we've been talking about, have one purpose, and that purpose is to raise the energy. That's what the Gita says. Um, knowing that the true purpose is an upward self-offering, which will free you from all karmic bondage. Now that is quite a promise, isn't it? It's because um, karma, let me think how to say this exactly. Karma is unlearned lessons. The entire purpose of life is very simple, which is for us to understand um, our own true nature. There are spiritual paths where the primary practice is an extremely simple one. It just says, who am I? Which is it's a very interesting question. Who am I? And the, uh, to understand the true answer to that question, and uh, just a moment, I'm losing my thought here. Let me find it. Oh, yes. Where, what causes suffering and what brings happiness? What is lastingly real? What causes suffering? What brings happiness? You know, this is what we're doing. This is the upward offering. And, what, what the, and, and so karma, in the Bible they call it sin, it can be called ignorance. My, my favorite personal definition, because it, it works the best for me, is unlearned lessons. In some way, I have a misunderstanding about who I am, what is lastingly real, what causes happiness, and what causes suffering. And so I get myself embroiled. I get embroiled with desires. I get embroiled with fears. I get embroiled with um, uh, selfish attitudes. Selfish meaning relating to how I have, to, with likes and dislikes, how I have to have things. I get embroiled and I am affirming less than the highest reality. And because um, the, my, the inevitable destiny, however many incarnations it takes, is for me to escape from all false ideas and to embrace the ultimate truth. I sort of see it as a, a spectrum through which I move from delusion to moksha, to perfect freedom. And in between, everything I don't understand about moksha and everything that I'm enamored about of delusion, I have to have some experience that will teach me. It's an unlearned lesson. And, and that also makes it very simple because in all the circumstances of our life, 
we always have this same question. What is it? Why am I suffering? You know, if, if anything in our life, instead of elevating us to spiritual joy, entraps us in some kind of pain, then that means there's something we don't understand. Because all of reality is bliss. And if I'm not in that bliss, that means because somehow there's something I don't know yet. There's a lesson I have to learn about the nature of life. And so we just keep moving upward. And the upward movement is when all of the energy, the, the lower, the, um, as Swami describes in here, that sometimes people think that you know, the lower chakras per se are undesirable, but that's not true because the, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, which are the three of the lower chakras, that, that quality of consciousness is all essential for, for moksha, for perfect freedom. So the problem is not the chakra itself, it's the direction in which the energy flows. The energy either flows outward to the world on that level, or it's, or it's interiorized, strengthened, and then lifted. You know, the first chakra is an example. The earth element is the power of, of determined fixity of purpose, of loyalty, of, of the capacity to be practical in our idealism. It's, there's your very high qualities. But if the energy just merely flows outward, it becomes grasping for material things, needing to make our security in the world, you know, to, um, to, to, we become fanatical in our thinking. We become fixed in the wrong ways. And then the energy doesn't interiorize, the energy doesn't elevate, it just drains out. And the deeper we get in true spiritual understanding, the more everything leads to an upward movement of energy. So when he says here, even the blessings of this world come not to him who gives nothing of himself, how can he hope for happiness then in a better world? So what we're doing, what, what he's trying to say here, what, he, what Krishna's talking about, is, is giving of ourselves, is not merely giving to the world, but giving to our true self, directing our energy toward the divine power within us instead of dissipating it out, using that energy, again, interior and upward. Because even the things of this world, the material world is run from the spiritual level. The, I mean, many people think that our destiny is determined first from outwardly, but our destiny is determined first from, from inside ourselves. Swami Kriyananda wrote a, a marvelous course, which is called Material Success and Happiness Through Yoga Principles. I believe it's available now from Crystal Clarity Publishers. It wasn't available. It was hard to get for a while. It's, a, it's not inexpensive. It's a three or two volume set it's it's uh, 26 long lessons. It's a it's a really it was first it was a, a course and now it's a course in a book. When Swami published that, he published it in India, um, out of uh, what he saw, what was actually presented to him by a, a medical doctor. The medical doctor said to Swami, Swami was a patient in the hospital. He said he was a barely conscious patient hardly an example. He was not an ex a sterling example in that moment of the great teachings that he represented. <laughs> he said he was barely conscious and he, was, he had double pneumonia and it was, it was a, a moment. The doctor came into the room and usually the doctor's question is, how can I help you? But the doctor came into the room because this was India and people knew that this great, great Swami was in their hospital. So this uh, uh, doctor came in and said to Swami, you know, Swamiji, sir, can you help me? Swami said he sort of pulled himself back from the brink of unconsciousness and said, if I can, certainly. And then with, with true deep feeling, Swami said, this doctor explained to, to Swamiji that this terrible dilemma that he faced, because it was unfortunately somewhat of a common practice in that hospital. It was not a it was a minor, it was a smaller hospital in some area, that sometimes people padded the bills and, 
did more things than they needed because it was just sort of, that was the what they had to do in order to maintain the income that they needed. And this doctor said his son was studying abroad and he had to take care of his college expenses. And But Swamiji said this was a noble man. And Swami said he could see in his eyes the anguish it caused him not to be absolutely true to Dharma. And so he was pleading with Swamiji for help. And so Swami came to the thought that what was really needed for the whole world, but also for India, was a, a practical expression about how Dharma is also the most effective way to achieve even the things of this world. And that's what this verse in the Gita is saying. So Swami then wrote this course. It took him like a year and a half to write it. These 26 very practical lessons about how you can be absolutely loyal to high principles and generate everything you need for every aspect of life. In other words, Dharma is the most practical way to live. Where there is Dharma, there is victory. Now, at the time, Swamiji published this course, which was about 2005, 2006. There were a number of well-known prosperity teachers who all had their own courses in their own ways. and So this sort of challenge was offered, like, what's the difference between this course you offer and these great programs these other people are offering? I was fascinated by Swami's response. His response was this, I am the disciple of a great master. That was his whole explanation. I am the disciple of a great master. Well, it fell to me to write some of the promotion for this course, and I I really wanted to think about what that really meant. And this is what I ended up saying, which I believe is the truth, and this is what Krishna is saying here. The spiritual world, most people who work with prosperity talk about how to manipulate the material world from the premise of the material world being the primary reality, and these are certain things that you can do. You know, you can arrange it this way, you can arrange it that way. But they're trying to influence the world with dynamic energy of the same type. You play the same game, but you play it better. By Swamiji saying, I am the disciple of a great master, what he was saying is the material world is run from the spiritual level. Because the lesser is always influenced by the greater. And even when we talk about the way the world is manifested, The material world is the last stop, not the first stop. The first stop is the causal level where thoughts exist. Then comes the astral level where energy exists. And then enough energy is applied, it manifests as a material world. But it doesn't go the other direction. Even if if we just think in a very mundane way, everything that we accomplish in this world, it starts with a thought, doesn't it? And the clearer and more powerful that thought is, and then we have to apply a lot of energy to that thought. That's the astral level. And then finally, it'll manifest in a material way. So the, the water never flows higher than its source. The more elevated our initial thought is, the more it's in tune with a cosmic flow, the more it reflects divine principles, the more our own energy is lifted up to that higher level, the more dynamic everything else that comes out of that will come. And so this is saying, you know, those who don't give in an upward moving way don't even get to experience the joy of this world. Those who are not in tune with that upward flow. So these are all the, um, these are some of the ways we can understand those verses. So, let's move on to the next. Chapter 4, verse 33. The inner spiritual fire ceremony of raising awareness is superior, O scorcher of foes, meaning Arjuna, to any outward act of self-offering. In this wisdom alone is all karma consumed. So again, we're talking about what is it that really changes our karma. Karma, bear in mind, karma 
karma is stored in the spine. Karma is vrittis of, of energy in the chakras. Okay, and when the reason karma carries on from lifetime to lifetime, the chakras are the mechanism by which karma is carried on from lifetime to lifetime. Everything that we do, every thought we think, every action, every emotion, every, everything we do reflects a certain level of consciousness from delusion to moksha. And, and it, it, it makes a statement about what we think is real, about who we think we are, and about where we think happiness comes from and where suffering comes from. Just every reaction. Somebody says something, you're frightened about it, you have a reaction, you begin to cry, you begin to yell. Somebody tells you a piece of news and you're elated because you think you're going to get this or you're depressed because you think you're going to lose that. You're riding in the car and it looks for a second like somebody's going to smash into you and you're a little panicked about that. It's like I am the body, the body's going to be hurt. If I'm hurt, you know, I don't think first, oh, Divine Mother is in charge. I think, oh dear, I'm going to be smashed to bits. All of these things spontaneously express a certain vibration of consciousness, an exact vibration. And, and all of them um, register in the chakras as a vritti of energy. And so that's, that is what our astral body, our energy body is. It's patterns of energy up and down the spine. When the physical body dies and the, the little actor gets up and we go on, that's pretty much seemingly exactly how it happens. But now we move in our energy body, which is the sum total of all of these vrittis. And each of those vrittis, insofar as they are not, we're not free, there's an ego involvement and they're still there. Those, that's all our karma. That's all our unlearned lessons. And all of those vrittis, when we're in the astral world and we're ready to incarnate in this world, those vrittis together create a, a combined vibration which will match a, a vibration, a potential in a material body. Master said, when the sperm and ovum come together, there's a flash of light in the astral world and those souls that are ready to incarnate who vibrate with that flash of light will rush to get into that womb. There we have it. I mean, those are marvelous tales that I take Master's word for. But then there's something that matches, or else we wouldn't be attracted, we wouldn't be able to enter, but there's a, a matching of that vibration. And then the karmic journey begins again. We're born in a certain culture, in a, a certain uh, ethnicity, uh, at a... At a uh, into whatever circumstances of wealth or impoverishment, of support or abuse, whatever it might be, in order for all of those vrittis of karma to have a chance to express so we get to have the experience we need so we can learn to transcend them. But the way the, the karma is really finally dissolved is when we elevate, when we draw all the energy up to a higher and higher understanding. Because from the spiritual level, we can see. From the level of the karma itself, I'm a victim, I'm mad at you, you mistreated me, I'm going to go after you, I lost this, I'm gonna get it back. You know, just all those different things that we do. From a higher level, as we move up the spine and can perceive it, we can tell that you know, nobody ever really did anything to me. I was just balancing, learning, doing something that needed to happen. People, the way I often think about it, people participate in my karma, but they don't create it. It's I who've created my own karma out of my own need to learn. And then people get drawn into it. And they provide for me the necessary experiences, because it's their karma too, to provide those experiences so I can know. But the point is not the experience itself. The point is to understand reality on a higher level. And that's why wisdom is what finally dissolves all the karma. Because when I finally understand that Divine Mother was always in charge, and the very idea that I was even separate was just an illusion, and then there's all karma is dissolved by wisdom. 
by the deliberate movement of energy up the spine. So that's why he says, any outward act of self-offering, excuse me, in this wisdom alone, um, is all action, karma, consumed, are all lessons learned. You know, isn't it so sometimes, I mean, well, it's not just sometimes, but it's always true. Whenever we, we progress, it's always because we have increased in awareness. Isn't that so? We thought something was good or true, or we thought this was the circumstance, and then we become more aware. You know, we, we used to think that revenge was really positive, but we could see that revenge doesn't really help. We used to think that being a victim was really positive, but after a time we realized that moving through life thinking we're a victim doesn't really help. We used to think that certain kinds of self-indulgence um, was a positive thing, but as we develop in life, we realize that that really wasn't a source of happiness after all. All of us can look just at the course of this one life at mistakes we made, and then we become aware that it was an error. We become aware that that attitude was actually misery producing instead of happiness producing. And we become aware because the vi our, our vibration raises. That's why you can't really persuade someone of something if they don't vibrate at a level where they're capable of understanding it. We can try to persuade them with as much logic as we can possibly do, but they won't say it. They won't see it. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, I'll go back to addiction. Addiction is one of the most just um, heartbreaking cycles that people go through. Can't you see that your continuation to, to give in to this addiction is ruining your life? Well, no. A person can't see it until they see it. But then an awareness will come suddenly that it is not happiness producing, it's misery producing. And at that point we will shift because we've, we've come to a higher vibration of understanding. And so in this way, this is how all karma is consumed in the end. So again, number 434. Understand this above all. By surrender of self-will to the wise, by sensitive inward and outward, outward questioning of the wise, and by service to the wise, those who have realized the truth will be able to convey their wisdom to you. So all of a sudden we've brought in another concept, which is how is this wisdom attained? So... Um, because I am in a position so often and have been for so many years where I have to explain these teachings, I am profoundly and deeply aware of the fact that what I myself know from my actual realization is not very much. But the realization I have had that actually molds everything is that there are people who actually do know, <laughs> if that makes sense. And way back at the beginning, when I, I met Swami Kriyananda in 1969, late November, and what I understood about him when I met him was that he, he was truly wise, that he really did know. And that in itself was the single most important realization I've had in this incarnation. Um, I was reading today, Jyotish, who is Swami Kriyananda's successor, has been his, was appointed as his successor while Swamiji was still living. And then in, in 2013, when Swamiji left his body, Jyotish, and then with the help of his wife, Devi, has been leading Ananda worldwide ever since. And because Swami Kriyananda's birthday is in a few days, Jyotish wrote this beautiful article. He puts out a blog every week. He, he and Devi alternate. And he just said, quite simply, my whole life has been molded by my knowing Swami Kriyananda. And he talks about what year it would have been. I met him in 69. I think Swami met Jyotish in 65. I think then maybe even 64. 
But Jyotis said, as he put it, he went unannounced and knocked on the door of Swamiji's apartment in the city of San Francisco on Easter Sunday of whatever year that was. He was a total stranger. Swami opened the door. Actually, Jyoti, she didn't put this into this blog, but on another occasion, he said, Swami opened the door and he said, I'm working on a project, would you help me? And Jyoti said, certainly I'd be glad to. And he said, I didn't realize at the time that that project would last the rest of my life. <laughs> I thought I was there to lick stamps or something like that. <laughs> Because, in fact, as you should look it up on the internet and read this, read it yourself, but Swami was, it was Easter Sunday and he was going out with some friends for a picnic in Golden Gate Park. He just invited Jyotish and his brother-in-law, who was with him, to just come with them. Now, that was sort of the beginning of it, but what it was, as I recall, that they were actually doing some little project that they needed to finish. Maybe it was a mailing or something like that before they could go on the picnic. So he invited Jyotish in to help with the project, and then they all went out to the picnic. But, but Jyotish puts it just exactly as I put it, although I put it a little more bluntly. I just say that if I hadn't met Swami, I'd be dead in a ditch by this time. Jyotish rather more elegantly just talked about how Swami molded his life. This is the very, very, very good karma of recognizing wisdom when it's personified in front of you. And then dedicating oneself to, to whatever is required to be able to um, partake of that wisdom, to receive that wisdom, to be able to gradually, and unfortunately it's very gradual, um, make it one's own. So he says here, it says, um, surrender of self-will to the wise sensitive inner questioning of the wise, service to the wise. In other words, making what they know and the desire to um, make it one's own the center point around which everything revolves. When I saw Swami, and of course, you know, it's past life karma. It was, it was literally an instant recognition before he spoke. He walked into the room and I knew about self-realization because I was 22 at that point when I was 18. I was introduced through Ramakrishna and Vivekananda to the teaching of self-realization. So I had an intellectual understanding and, and I'd also had the psychedelic experience to know that con changing consciousness was the point. Um, but I had never seen it is the only way I could put it. And so Swami walked in and just by intuition, I, I knew what I was looking at. <laughs> and, and the only way I can describe it is I was looking at a free soul. I was looking at, at I, I want to say a person, but it was almost like I was looking at an entity that did not have boundaries. And in that r recognition of how different Swamiji was from anyone I'd ever encountered, this was, again, before he spoke, so this was just vibrational. I recognized that all the rest of us were confined. Now, later I understood all of these things by ego boundaries, and I could just feel that there was, I couldn't find the edge of Swamiji's consciousness. I didn't have the wherewithal to, to enter into it, but I had enough to realize it was completely different, and that what he was was what I wanted to become. It, the phrase was, he has what I want. And he, by the, I don't remember anything that he said, except somehow I found out he was a disciple of Master. I probably knew that already because friends of mine had told me about him. Um, I also realized at the end he was highly intelligent and very entertaining, but that was entirely extra. <laughs> um, but I also just saw <laughs> I, need, I need to be in, in close proximity to this, um, this wise man because what, it, what he has what I want and I need to be able to get that. So one of the ways that we move forward in our spiritual life is to seek those who can help us move forward. 
and then behave in right relationship to them. Now, Swamiji has, uh, is a disciple, of a direct disciple of Yogananda. Everything that Swami gave us, he said, was his guru through him. He never himself claimed it. But even the ability on Swami's part to follow this verse in the Gita and to have devoted himself to becoming um, to the service of the wise in the form that it came to him. That was also his teaching. His teaching was discipleship. And so when I, what I was starting to say at the beginning here, it's always been very important to me not to claim as my own what, what is actually um, what I've learned from someone else and have come to believe you know, there's, this, there's, there's many levels of realization. One level of realization is the direct perception. The other level of the realization is to have had sufficient experience of the wisdom of someone, the, the veracity of someone else's wisdom. So I believe in the absolute truthfulness of everything that Yogananda said. So even if I don't understand it, I know it's true. I believe in the absolute truthfulness of all that Swamiji shared with us. So even if I can't verify it from my own experience, I can verify my trust in Swami, and therefore step by step. And how one could possibly progress without um, a pole star, a guru, with, and, and pole star to me is a dynamic way of describing it, a point of reference by which everything else is measured. And that's why this whole story about lifting your energy, all of a sudden we're talking about our relationship to those who are wise. And it's very, very important that it come in this, in this point because we can't always know from our own at our own direct experience, what is the right way to do something? Even when you're learning to play a musical instrument or to dance in a certain way, the, your mind might make up shortcuts and you'll think that it'll work better if I do it like this. But somebody who knows how it's to be done can see you know, what you need to do to be able to, to stay the course. And so we have to be in right relationship to the wise and we have to behave in such a way that their wisdom can become our own. And that is the good news. <laughs> As Swami puts it in the Festival of Light, ever and again through your awakened sons, the answer comes to us. And if we open ourselves to it, then that truth becomes our own. God bless you, my friend.